Welcome to Entrepreneurs Podcast, the podcast for developpreneurs. The podcast where you get to be a fly on the wall listening to real conversations of three developers trying to tackle the challenges they face as entrepreneurs. All right, we are live. Awesome. Welcome back, John. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, I forgot. I was I wasn't here last. Yeah, I was traveling last last week. Yep. So, I'm back finally. It was a little bit too long. Barcelona is pretty cool, but it was just a little There's bit Chuck. too long. So, I was Chuck. ready to be back. So, hey guys. Hey Chuck. Hey JavaScript Tower. <laughs> <laughs> Is it cold? Is it getting pretty cold out there already? No, it's warm outside. It's just the AC's turned up too high in it. For some reason, my office gets cooler than everywhere else. So. Nice. I just throw on a hoodie. Those days, <laughs> those days are not far away, man. Shit, summer is over. That's true. Sucks. Manny, what are you talking about? <laughs> 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 man, it goes from like 72 degrees to like 69 degrees. It's, such a John bummer, about it. man. it's true. I was freezing my ass off at Pat Flynn's thing. Uh, <laughs> it, it's it's because unexpected cold is like is is the worst. It's like <laughs> yeah, that, that's when it gets down to 67 degrees, Josh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> unexpectedly it drops by 2.5 degrees. It's like oh ho ho. Yeah, what did you do? <laughs> Well, it's, it's weird in San Diego. There's, it's actually like most of the year, it's like on the edge of like y your best bet in San Diego is to wear layers, right? Because or to bring, All the time. Because it will get like, it, it's not like it gets cold, but it gets uncomfortably cold just below the, the comfort threshold of like wearing a short sleeve shirt, right? Yeah. And so it's like, it just dips right down into that like, you know, what's it like? Maybe like 72 degrees. You need down. a jacket all the yeah. time. And then you're like, you're just like, you're, you're dressed for the, for the warm and it was warmer earlier, but then it's just like, just slightly uncomfortably cold. Right. Yeah. So. yeah I remember and, the traffic and conversion a couple of years up on the roof mm -hmm. that, that was, it was that way. It was like mm -hmm. just a and slight breeze. The, the Delta is really in the sun. So if you're in the sun, yeah. you'll be fine. As soon right. as you get in the shade, you are cold. Like yeah. you're literally <laughs> freezing because the winds are blowing. There's no sun anymore, so now there's a drop of like five degrees from that, and that changes everything. Yeah, you pretty much summed up every Californian I know. <laughs> there, there's this range, right? There's comfortably warm, which is 70 degrees and above, and then 69 is just colder than cool. comfortable, and then 68 and lower is freezing. <laughs> freezing. There is going to be ice forming at the end of my nose, freezing. Oh my gosh, I'm going to die freezing. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's all about preparation, right? It's always that's, like it's managing cool. expectations. So I mean, it's the con it's the con contrast principle, right? So here in here in uh, Pennsylvania, we go from uh, like over this summer it, it hit ninety five. Like heat index was like one hundred and five, hundred ten degrees some days, and then we go we'll go all the way down to, I mean, last winter we had minus fifteen, I think. Yeah. Plus, plus the wind. Like we had like yeah. thirty we below, forty too. below wind chills. It was like you know, it's like a hundred and twenty. And so our closets are like, you've got to have like you know the Eskimo clothes and the beach clothes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it gets humid out there in Pennsylvania. Yeah, too, doesn't it? yeah, it does. Yep. Because because here it'll get like you know minus five, minus ten, but it's dry, and so you just put a coat on, and it doesn't like cut through your layers of clothes. Yeah. yeah. When I was in Italy, it, it got down to freezing a couple of times, and then it was so humid that you'd be wearing a coat and you'd get a good wind, and it's like, man, it feels like I'm not wearing anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Freezing. All right. So I um I'm currently I'm I'm not uh, on my usual laptop today. So I, um, oh, no. I, I think, have I told, did I tell you guys that um, the bottom of my laptop case was bulging? I think I, I read, I read so, that email. I actually read one of your emails, Josh. Oh, okay. There we go. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, the, the bottom of my case was, had started to bulge about a year ago and I noticed it. And then I, buddy? now it, it had gotten to the hey, point where I want to call. It yeah, had gotten to the point where the little, little rubber feet no longer sat on the desk. 
yeah. and I could just sort of spin it. <laughs> so I took Wait. it in. I took it like, in the, that's like strangely suspicious of like a battery problem that's going to explode. Yeah, I know <laughs> like, exactly. You so should I took have just it in. waited for it to pop out the baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like the alien. It was about to. <laughs> um, yeah, so I took it in, and they're like, I was like, yeah, I think the battery's swelling, and they're like, yeah, and then, but it, it, it's, they were telling me it was going to take five to seven days to get it replaced. So I, I the, 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 uh, I was like, man, that's not, I can't do that. Like, how am I going to make this work? And the guy's like, well, tell you what, sometimes what, will ha what people will do in this situation is they will, they'll buy a laptop to just kind of <laughs> evaluate it, <laughs> you know, see, see if you like the new model of the Mac. And then, you know, you can decide when your other laptop come back, comes back, you can decide what you want to do. I was like, all right, we'll do that. So $1,700 MacBook. Uh, model here, so I don't have any USB ports, so I'm, I'm using the, the <laughs> headphones. I, that feels, I have yeah. complained about that on this show. I won't do it yes. again. It yes. seems to have a shitty camera. Take it, it back. It, well, it, yeah, yeah, exactly. I honestly, I really don't like it. Like, yeah. I really don't like it. I, I'm, yeah, the my, keyboard is horrible. The keyboard is terrible. Um, the new, uh, I mean, I love the size. The size is great. It's it's so light. Um, but the 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 um, they're going to replace when they replace the battery on those because it's basically welded to the chassis. Like <laughs> they like gut the whole thing. They're replacing the keyboard, um, part of the chassis and I possibly the back plate if it's bowed and it's only going to cost you 200 bucks. I'm basically going to have half a new laptop. Um, and so I'm, I'm like the only thing that was bugging me about it was that it was getting kind of slow and it never really occurred to me that that might be an issue with the heat. Like, Whenever I would start up Excel, which I've been doing a lot lately, it would just like everything would just bog down, and it was ridiculous. I'd have to force quit things. And the guy was telling me, "Yeah, there's there's like throttling. The heat sensors are in the battery, so it'll throttle the system down when the battery's going." So, ah, the um, battery's yeah, so about I, to explode. Yeah, <laughs> the battery's about to explode. If if yeah, like you've gone on the airplanes, and they and yeah. they're like. If you have any kind of cell phones that have bad batteries or you know that your batteries and you're like, oh, oh, right here, right here. Right here. Right here. Oh, um, this is bulging. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think you're okay, sir. Just, yeah. <laughs> as long as you don't have a bulge in your pocket, it's all good. That's that's not C4. It's just the battery, I promise. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm probably going to get it back next week. And it'll be. I think it'll basically be I mean, it should be just as fast. Like, I think that should fix the the heat and processor issues. And the, I've ne I, I I had an old battery when I got it because I got it's a 2012, and I got it and like it was like three years old when I got it. So it's gonna be like a brand new machine, pretty much. So I'm pretty. I'm ha I'll be happy to get it back. This is like, yeah. I just I honestly just really don't like it. I don't know. Like when it, when they when I have to replace the other one, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. Hopefully it'll be good for a few more years. So you're using a 2012 laptop? Yeah, yeah. It's a it's the 13 inch MacBook Pro, and it was spec'd wow. out. That was just, top. That just goes yeah. to show the kind of work Josh does does on a daily basis nowadays compared to his programming days. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, I guess we could all use Chromebooks. Like, do yeah, not yeah. upgrade. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, mainly it's um. Uh, yeah, I mean nothing super processor intense. So if I had, I don't have to do any yeah, video. Yeah. With, so. I, I don't, I don't know what was happening. Like last time, I was trying to watch some videos, like going through a playlist. And every once in a while, my computer will just like it will slow down to the point where it won't play YouTube videos. Whoa! So, and I'm like, what the fuck? Like it's a five thousand dollar laptop. It's got like, <laughs> it's got like the top of the line SS. SSDs. It's got a full like a GTX 780 graphics card in there. I don't know, and and like 64 gig of RAM. Whoa! <laughs> just like I'm just like, what the heck? How could like you know a little tiny, you know, crap laptop not have this problem? But I don't know. So that sucks. <laughs> I'm not buying a custom laptop. I mean, yeah, anymore. I'm just. Oh, well, there are no good market alternatives right now. Like the MacBook. Has such bad keyboard, touchpad sucks. It's just the the whole stupid uh, touch bar on the top is ridiculous. It's like, yeah, this one doesn't have the touch bar. The MacBook doesn't. <laughs> have. Bless you.
Oh, you have um, the MacBook. Oh my god. Yeah, not the MacBook Pro. Yeah. No wonder your camera sucks. It's probably the lowest. Yeah. Of <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, yeah I didn't, the MacBook is pretty crap. Yeah. I didn't get the three thousand dollar MacBook Pro. I got the, the seventeen hundred dollar one. So, but yeah, honestly, like I'm kind of glad because I, you know, the size is really nice, and I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind it if. If the keyboard was was comparable and it had some actual ports on it, I would exactly wouldn't mind it so much. But the, the port thing the, is ridiculous. I would take the old chassis with the new chipset and everything. I would buy that yeah. any day. But have you real. seen Have you seen the commercials? There's like commercials on Netflix with the guy. There's like it's like a, a I think it's a Samsung commercial and they're mocking Apple and they the guy goes in. He's like. He's talking to the genius, and the guy's like, "Well, what if I want to plug in my headphones to my iPhone?" And he's like, "Well, you need a dongle." And then he's like, "A dongle?" And he's like, "Yeah." And then he's like, well, "What if I want to charge while I listen to something on my headphones?" He's like, "Oh, then you need this other dongle. It's like a double dongle." And the guy's like, "Double dongle? That sounds explicit." <laughs> it's, it's awesome. <laughs> I love that commercial. So much. But anyway, yeah. yeah, you can't say you can't say dongle. That can get you thrown out of conferences. <laughs> out of oh, yeah. Good old PyCon. <laughs> the, uh, the thing is, is that like nobody remembers the names of the people involved. It's yeah. just PyCon has a black eye now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I oh I um. So I'm getting back to work finally. Now, to, to transition to wor work topics, uh, so that's <laughs> good. John, I, isn't I, that a four-letter word for you? I know it is, it is. <laughs> but I've been shooting videos this whole time, so it's uh, that's all good. But but uh, yeah, I try to get back in. I'm getting back into the system. But I j interviewed uh, James Clear. So that was oh, cool. excellent. Nice. Yeah, excellent. he's got a book coming out called Atomic Habits. So uh, nice. So that was cool. That was one of my <laughs> people I've always wanted to interview. Uh, so, and then uh, I got my slides done for FinCon. So, <laughs> what I did though, as oh, I made the slides, me. what's that? That reminds me, I'm going to be at Microsoft Ignite. It's in Orlando the same week. Oh, really? Okay, we'll have to meet up for like yeah. uh, for dinner or something. Yeah. Okay. But um, yeah, I, I got the slides done. So I'm doing a talk on YouTube, like being prolific on YouTube. And like how to do it and systems and kind of examples and, and stuff. And then uh, and then I what I decided to do this time was I made all the slides and then we'll see how this goes. I did a fiver gig for like fifty bucks, and I'm gonna have them make it look nice. All right, or as nice as they can for five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I paid fifty bucks for it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, we'll see. But yeah, that's that's so you gave point. them your keynote and then they're gonna convert that into a better version, yeah, yeah, hopefully. And yeah, so. they'll Photoshop your face over his, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's all you need, that's the better, that's, that's the upgraded better. version, yeah. So, I don't know, we'll, we'll see what happens with that, but, uh, it'll be interesting. But as I was thinking about it too, like I was forming, formulating like the strategy, which I think that, uh, that Josh, I think we've seen the strategy working as like the optimal strategy. Cause I used to talk about like uh, two strategies, right? The, the basically swing for the fences strategy mm -hmm. where you produce like epic content, but you only produce it very infrequently. Like, uh, you know, this American life is a common example of that. It's like super right. high quality, but they have a show once a week. I mean, and I think they used to have a show once a month, but uh, but it, it takes like 15 people, you know, it, it's like, you know, uh, right. but, but they get like, you know, tons of peers. And then the second strategy being super prolific, you know, producing a ton of content and that, you know, and that you're getting a lot of base hits that eventually grows and grows and grows. Uh, but I, you know, I think that the, what I talked about in the, or what I'm going to talk about in the talk is, you know, those basic two strategies and how being prolific is important, but but a hybrid strategy of like an 80 20 or more like a 90 10 where 90 percent of your content is prolific so you're producing a ton of content but 10 percent of it is epic right which is kind of what we've been doing with simple programmer with the blog i think right with the seo mm -hmm. and stuff it's like we've got those few epic pieces there those outliers and those ones are not even i mean the content itself is actually even not that epic it's like 
epic effort like it's seo'd like to that's really the, right. the secret there and it's i mean it, it's definitely higher the higher quality content but i think that's really the the best content strategy now is, is that kind of hybrid approach where you're yeah where you're doing both well and, and the stuff that you're producing prolifically is really more for your existing audience mm -hmm. and then occasionally you'll get something that unexpectedly grabs a huge new piece of audience like that's yeah. what happened with the the top 10 programming languages for 2018 like that was kind of something that we i mean that was just a video transcript exactly yeah and uh, you may have seo'd that i think rodrigo may have seo'd that title but um it was yeah it's just it was the um you know but that's like now our number or number one or number two post <laughs> it brings in like you know 10 percent of our all of our traffic exactly yeah but well, we got to hit some more of those, I think, with simple programmers. Just come up with more. That JavaScript one needs to be SEO'd. I, I think more like more link backs to it. But yeah, I've got I've got our SEO team looking at that. So yeah, I, I have a list of about six posts that are high priority for them to build links to when they can, and um, they can't always just determine what. Sometimes they'll get like an agreement to get a link placed, but they won't. They can't specify what the post will be because it just doesn't fit oh, so yeah. um but that's on the list of the short list of, of ones that i want them to promote so they're going to be working on it do you yeah. guys have an editor yes uh i mean what kind of editing does your do you have editing guidelines yeah yeah we, we work with um elisa from craftyourcontent.com mm -hmm. and she's got a team and uh, we have there's at least two or three members of her team that work on our stuff off and on. And they have like a style guide and a whole editorial process and everything for everybody to go through. So it's, it's a, it's a well-oiled machine at this point. But it, it's funny though. It's like the content doesn't matter as much as the link backs. Like, yeah. Well, the, 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 the topic, it's a, it's the combination of the yeah. topic being something that gets searched a lot and then building building the SEO around it. That's really the the major those are the two major factors. It's like topic selection. On it, I mean like it's it's kind of almost a joke, but but really what matters is the title. <laughs> yeah. The title and the backlinks. <laughs> the title and <laughs> or, the backlinks, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, but yeah, because you can spend so much effort and energy creating content. And it's good for your existing audience, like we we're saying, yeah. but like the most effective thing is just to pick a few good, you know, SEO keywords to go after. Yeah. Build that content. Hopefully, make that epic content, and then backlink the hell out of it, and that's going right. to be more effective than any other thing that you yep. could possibly do. Yeah. So. What I typically what I typically encourage people to do now is like the kind of content that we we used to publish on Simple Programmer that used to bring in traffic doesn't bring it anymore. That's like the good the stuff to use for guest posts. Yeah, where you're getting backlinks, you know, they're like relatively, they're easier. Like the guest post can be easier to write, um, and uh, and then you have like Brian Dean's strategy is he basically has thirty articles on his site that he's constantly updating. Yeah, and they're you know they're really good, they're epic, they're they're in depth, um, and he's not producing content all the time. And if you honestly, if you produce a ton of content, it's, it can actually hurt you because the more you have out there it dilutes your like your authority for your domain gets spread across all your content so if you've got 10,000 pages it actually dilutes your it can dilute your overall kind of like the, the the authority for the site so it's better yeah it's better to have the game has shifted on that it's better to have less but higher quality prune out the losers yeah but I think it's possible to engineer at this point, like to really double or triple, maybe quadruple the traffic just by keep on engineering these posts with the link backs. So, at least from what what we've seen so far, right? Like with yes, the success of that, it's it's yep, it's pretty amazing how how big of a it's kind of disappointing how big of a difference it because like that second the second best one we have is. It's, it's a, terrible. It's, it's <laughs> if it's if anyone listening wants to write a blog post about interviewing questions, please reach out to Josh at simpleprogrammer.com um, because I'm trying to get someone. We have this post. I literally created it as a placeholder 
I went, there was a guy who had a post that ranked pretty high for top interviewing questions, or just programming interview questions, I think was the, the keyword. And I went to him and I was like, hey, could you just do another version of that article for my site? And he was like, okay. So he just basically did the exact same thing that he already had. He, I mean, it, was, it, was, it wasn't article spinning, but it was, you know, same basic idea, like just copy something that's working. And now it's like our number one blog post. <laughs> it's ranking, and it sucks. <laughs> it was a place. It was a placeholder. I was validating a theory, and it worked. And now I want to get somebody. So I'm trying to get Parker from Interview Cake. I, I emailed him to to talk to him about doing it, and then he, he I get his autoresponder. I'm at Burning Man. <laughs> like okay, I, don't think, I guess it'll be a while. But I know I was tempted to do my own <laughs> to make it like you know 300 questions and like pages of you know what i mean because that's what we really need is something yeah. like where it's like like 300 questions like it's by far it's like yep. 10 times better than, the, than yep. the best and it's super comprehensive and then eventually and then it's one of those pillar contents where or the tree where where uh where it links to uh, if yeah. it, if it starts off with the answers on other people's sites, but eventually all the answers become pages on the site, on right. our site, and then that's that's the, I think that that'll kill it. So. Yeah, that's where I want to go with it. I just haven't. I've 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 put it out there a few two a few different places, and so far nobody's taken me up on it. It's a good. It would be good exposure for somebody. I mean, it's going to be like, if somebody were to write this blog post. Like we'll give you a link to whatever it is that you're doing, and you'll get like I mean that that page traffic. will get like yeah like hundreds of thousands of page views a year. Like but it has to be years. epic. It has to be essentially like yeah. a book that a blog post. You know what I mean like a yeah you know, like a ten thousand word or more blog post, right? I, that, I guess I'm not 100 percent clear what you're looking for though. Is it just a list of interview questions then or yeah yeah basically i mean basically right now what it is is it's literally like top it's like the title is top 50 interview question or top 50 programming interview questions or something oh, like that I see. and it's like header maybe like a sentence or two and then like a link to an answer somewhere yeah. so it's it's really like a table of contents almost and we're and not it, even worried if you try and steal our idea because you can't outrank us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what it, that's what being number one will do for you. Yeah. How much does the editing cost you guys, and how much do they do for you? Like, what all do they uh, do? Well, I don't want to. Yeah, let's not yeah, discuss the exact yeah. price on that yeah, just because it's not ours to like. But we're actually, and we're actually not like she told me that we're like her lowest priced client because we got in early and they've grandfathered us and all that we stuff. Should, so. We should take this uh, show off air so we can talk about <laughs> some private issues. <laughs> it's like, it's like, I mean, it's basically, it's a, an inexpensive part-time person. Yeah. Basically. Like it's not a lot of money. Um, how much, how much time does it take to edit a 2000 word blog post or a 3000 word blog post for them? Well, the way they do it, probably several hours because they do a lot of so the original agreement that she made with John was John wanted this to be an outlet for people that were getting started with blogging and so they do a lot of hand holding Elisa was telling me they do a lot of hand holding yeah. with new writers to kind of teach them you know how to structure their posts so it's not like copy it's not like copy editing like where you're just you know fixing commas and stuff it's like developmental edit where they give them feedback and say like this is broken here's how you fix it so yeah i mean i i wouldn't be surprised if they're spending two to four hours or more per article just on the editing and stuff that would Very be mine yeah it, it might be more I, I i've done this type of work a lot and it's it's time consuming like it's easier as an editor to fix it yourself than it is to work with somebody over three drafts and get them to do it you know, it'd be interesting, Josh. Would be like to to augment the process, like to take what we're learning from the SEO team, right? That the consultants and basically distill that down. Like, what is their their process? Have um have that be part of the process for like uh, for the article writers, for the writers mm -hmm. for the blog, and then basically like offer some kind of like reward system of like 
if you get this many link backs or we either make it link back based or page view based but maybe link back base would be mm -hmm. would be fine enough like mm -hmm. and you'll get like this you know stipend or whatever it is like a prize or you know competition or something like that where uh, i think that that'd be kind of cool to have them actually doing the the link back like you're responsible right. for link backing your articles or promoting your own content yeah like it because not just promoting it but doing the link back the actual seo on it that's the right the key so did you see their membership site transition josh mm -hmm. i saw the link i didn't actually it was a video right i didn't have a chance yeah. to watch it when it came through can you get what was the what was the uh approach his approach was for anyone who bought anything previously um so he's moving everything the whole mm. whole shebang to his membership only platform okay and he sold courses that were like twenty five hundred dollars fifteen hundred dollars all that stuff and now what he's saying is um you will still have lifetime access to the courses that you paid for mm -hmm. not only that that will also give you um you know credit for the membership because you're a loyal customer and you bought before from us so i'll give you credit for whatever you, in proportion to whatever you paid for the annual mm -hmm. membership or the monthly membership or whatever they sign up for so that was probably the easiest not easiest but uh, in my opinion the cleanest because mm -hmm. everything else is Who's this? Not clean enough um did i send you guys the list you saw that Chuck? no yeah sean west right sean west i don't know who the guy is i just stumbled upon that post and i was like whoa that's really cool way of looking at it because i was agonizing over it as well like if i have to go membership it's just going to be so challenging to figure out all the different like how do you take care of the people from the past how do you make them feel secure and he has it down better than anyone else so far I've seen. That's yeah, I was, you know, I was thinking about this whole thing with the courses and the membership, right? Uh, I finally read Blue Ocean Strategy, mm -hmm. which is a really good book. Really mm -hmm. short, too. It's pretty good. So, but uh, what I realized was that uh, Udemy is Blue Ocean. That's what they did. They came in and they fucked everyone, right? <laughs> Basically, because they, they came in and they they, they created a, a a value disruption, right? A, a, a value in it, value yeah. innovation. Yeah, was value innovation. Yeah, right. so because because what like if you look at it, what was happening was you had you had online training, you had plural site like like uh, Netflix type of subscription places, right? Which was the plural site, you know, uh, lynda.com, all of these like monthly ones. And then you had us, right? And the, and the people that were doing what we were doing, which were basically like, uh, you're selling $300 courses, right? Right. Uh, and then they came in and they said, okay, value disruption. What we're going to do, Blue Ocean, we're going to get a bunch of new customers. We're going to make the price, uh, you know, competitive to paying like a monthly subscription, except it's a la carte. And then mm -hmm. they came in and used that business model with the marketplace model and bam, just completely yep. demolished, changed the, the entire industry. Because I think that's really what's, you know, I don't know. It's still a theory, but I, I think that's what's screwing sales. I think, yeah, I think so. I, that's just how markets evolve too. That is inevitable mm -hmm. that you will not get away from that. Like there will, there will never be, there will never be a market that's immune to that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so it was, you know, I was, I was kind of expecting it to happen. Um, it was weird the way it happened so quickly. Like it seemed like there was a lag. And it didn't happen, and then it just fell off. <laughs> yeah. And it was really so that the the falling off the cliff, like if it had been more gradual, I would have expect I would have I think I would have actually had more of an idea what was going on. John, because, John, don't try to take the blame away from yourself. If that's what you're <laughs> doing, this is not the, not the forum for that. Well, there there is an aspect to that too, right? Because 
one blue ocean that we had. Well, okay. So any business that's a celebrity business is a blue ocean right. automatically because yep. there's only one of you, right? And it's always different. Like, you know what I mean? You're automatically blue ocean if you make a celebrity business because what you're offering is different than anyone else because it's, it's yeah, unique, we lost, right? Yeah, we lost our USP. Yeah, so, so there is an aspect of that. But again, to healthily grow the business, it's better to not have that be your your yeah. USP if you, if you want to. Yeah. So, so I've, been, I've been thinking a lot about this this week. And what I've been like, what I've really wanted to do all along was to not, not replace John, not try to replace John, but build off of like the traffic and the list and everything that we have and build, you know, build something that is more along the lines of a plural site. And I'm starting to feel like, I'm starting to think that um, that is too big of a jump. <laughs> um, and that I actually do need to step into the gap more and um possibly like i'm thinking i might need to I'm, I'm really leaning towards doing a podcast like spinning up a simple programmer podcast and be back. build okay um yeah really like build work on my personal brand and connection with the audience for like the next year because when i bring people in the problem is right now when i bring people in there's not a like there's not a huge amount of trust that i can transfer Versus with John, like John had this huge long history and he could just, you know, boom, he could just bring somebody else in and it was an immediate, immediate, like, okay, this guy's part of the club. Um, so I'm kind of thinking that, I mean, I'm, I want to, like, I'm going to continue with what I've been doing with the membership and um, launching, you know, trying to launch a few courses and stuff here. But I think a big focus is going to need to be, um, like, can the personal, e the, the, the emails, the daily emails are definitely working the way that I want to. Um, I, I'm starting to get like, I'm getting less like crappy responses <laughs> of yeah. like, can I, you know, can you teach, how do I learn .NET um, type, type of responses? And I'm starting to get more in-depth, thoughtful responses. I had a guy um, email me and say like, you know, I was really skeptical when I first saw your name and now I kind of think of you and John It's like, you know, kind of, he's kind of elevated me up to that pedestal almost. Um, and then I had another guy email me that I forwarded to John that was like begging to be let into the membership. <laughs> he missed the membership and oh, he was yeah. like begging, <laughs> like begging, pleading on hands and knees to be let into the membership. Yeah. Um, so it, it definitely seems like, it seems like the momentum starting to build a little bit more. And I, I, I'm thinking that I need to um, just double down on that. And I'm, like, I'm really leaning towards doing, uh, doing a podcast. I think that cause that would just give me the longer format. I think the, the emails are good. Um, it's that daily contact. And then the podcast will give me the chance to just build a deeper relationship with the the people that are actually going to end up becoming customers. Yeah. I've really, I, I've been slicing the list up and we only have of the 90, we have like about 91,000 subscribers right now. Uh, I've done some aggressive pruning lately, but we have like 91,000 subscribers. We only have about, 20,000 US subscribers. And um, I, I looked at the people that were, if they have a lead score of at least 100 in drip, those subscribers are worth $43 each. Oh, and wow. the, rest of, the rest of the list is probably worth less than $5. Yeah. Um, so like basically the core of our business is really about 4,200 people. Right. Um, mm. So I'm, I'm looking for ways that I can deepen, you know, deepen the re relationship with those people. And I think like the, I'm really leaning towards doing a podcast and it would be probably be an interview format type of, I might even do like a panel type thing like you do Chuck, but um, probably we'll be waiting on that a little bit, maybe later this year, spin that up. And that would also, I need to get like, I kind of need to get a, another, a little bit of a content production team put together to, so I'm not so reliant on Rodrigo. Um, yeah. So that way, like, you know, I can have a separate, I think I would like to have a separate, um, like podcast editing production. That's not tied to Rodrigo. Cause he's pretty, he's fairly maxed out right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that uh, I agree. That'd be good. And it's just good to have that <laughs> anyway, you know, for, <laughs> so that we're not totally right. on Rodrigo. So yeah. Yep. 
Okay. Yeah, it'd be it'd be interesting too. I wonder, like, maybe this is a good test if you want to do a podcast. Is to uh, like uh, test, you know, having it run under uh, under Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I actually emailed. That? Yeah, I, I emailed uh, Chuck. I would I would seriously love to just be able to just do do recording and have get help with like scheduling the podcast mm -hmm. and everything like. If you if if that was a service like if if you got your service to that level where, you know, I would be like, okay, this is the type of guests I want. Um, you know, I was going to talk about that today, but yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, if if it's the type of thing where I can just show up, and you know, do a little prep work, show up, interview the guest, and then you know, drop a Zoom file, an MP3 somewhere. Yeah. Then I would love, I would just love that, and I would definitely. You know, like we we do have people that were sponsoring the old podcast, right? So you know, it would potentially you know we could work do something split, out there. Yeah. yeah, do a split. Yeah, there. and then it'd be good because we could bring them. You know, the, our sponsors, and then if Chuck is able to fill the slots with his sponsorship, essentially we would just turn over the sponsorship filling to Chuck, right? And then have yeah. a revenue share, right? So it'd yeah. be like it'd be like one of his podcasts. But it'd be it, it's it's the whole publisher model, right? Mm -hmm. He'd be the publisher right. of our podcast, and so he would be getting you know we'd have a split between the the revenue. Yeah. But uh, that'd be cool, and that'd be actually a cool model for you to like test with us, Chuck. Because if you could do that, that like expands your reach. That takes things to the next yeah. level for you because now you yeah. can have podcasts that like and and it's such a value add, right? Because like thinking mm -hmm. about it, it's like you know if if we can just be, if Josh could just show up with the mic, right. That yeah. like, and produce a podcast, he's the talent essentially. And you're able to, you know, mm -hmm. your team is able to handle everything else. Then yeah, that's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, um, you, I feel like you guys are trying to go back in a direction that you've already moved forward from. Um, the guy I really like, I've been envying the most lately is this guy I see at Pat Flynn's uh, <laughs> uh, meetups every once in a while, uh, Robert Farrington. He's the founder of College Investor. It's a blog, multi-author blog. Uh, he has grown that stuff tremendously just as a multi-author blog. And he's able to do shit ton of uh, all sorts of marketing to the point where uh, I think he's a million dollar plus in revenue right now. Uh, gross and they're already getting offers for like 6x multiples on that number uh, and it's really nothing it's got nothing to do I, I wonder if like there's any mention of Robert there on the whole freaking website anymore well there's there's a couple of things that I keep in mind with this uh, the first one I would say is that it is in the financial industry so it's a much more different and lucrative industry uh, the second one which is probably actually more important is the fact that his revenue is is like 90% derived from affiliates and sponsorship. Mm -hmm. So he's not selling products which require trust, right? right. It, the moment yeah. that he's like 300 bucks and I'll show you how to get out of debt, now there mm -hmm. has to be a trust transfer. But if mm -hmm. it's like, hey, there's this big ass company lending tree and this is where you can get a loan and you know and that you've already heard of them they're already a brand name and this is who i recommend or you know this is mentioned in this article it's a totally different different thing I'm, so, I'm with you on both of those fronts all yeah. i'm saying is he's been able to build a business and get it to the point where he is kind of sort of disassociated from the brand now um yeah. as in anyone can take over college investor and right. run that business and uh whether you know the problem with the the celebrity businesses that unfortunately i have built you built and i feel like you guys still want to do, go down the path it's like you're still limited by yourself uh you can say yeah it's a different industry yeah there is a different uh composition of um how you get paid but there's always angles in every industry of how you can get paid for you know, in the coding industry, because coding industry is not cheap either. It's really expensive leads for boot camps, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think there's 
it's pretty dangerous to keep going down the path of celebrity business model if unless you guys want to do that for a very long time well i mean i don't mind i like what i'm doing right now mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. if i could do what i'm doing right now if i could do what i was doing right now and know that the business was going to grow for five or ten years i would be happy with that um i would like to i do i do agree that i would like to not be um you know i i would like to not i would like to not be the a celebrity so much but i guess what i'm saying is i think that there might need to be a bridge like it's yeah. it's very hard to go from i I've, I've been told by multiple people that they don't can't think of an example where a celebrity type business successfully transitioned and continued to grow in the absence of the celebrity um, but they didn't say that you have to substitute the celebrity with a new celebrity what's that did they say that you have to substitute the celebrity with a new yeah. celebrity uh there are i've known i know of a lot of examples where they've been able to hand off to a new celebrity yes um zig ziglar's business is a, is an example that is like well, after zig ziglar died like it still exists but it's like a shadow of what mm -hmm. it was i mean if those guys know how to sell <laughs> yeah but they're, um, they're selling they're, they're not creating new zig ziglar content because zig is not with us anymore right so but the, they're still creating sales and marketing and stuff yeah, they are, and they're working with people because Zig, they're well. So their company had other speakers and other names, and so they're they're still creating right. content that way. But right. Zig was by and far what they were selling the most of. Yeah. So yeah, so I'm not I'm I'm not actually planning what I'm what I'm not uh, what I'm proposing is not going whole hog again and and like trying to trying to replicate John. But what I'm saying is taking a half step back and working on building the building, establishing myself more with the audience and then using that to bring, bring in more voices where I can, uh, it, it, this would be a good experiment actually, because this month we're launching Jason Humphrey and I are launching the course on coding interviews. Mm. And so we'll see if I can, we'll see how effectively I can sell that. Basically what, I mean, Emails have to come from somebody. They're going to come from me for a long time. They don't so, have to come just from you, though. No, but every time we split off and have somebody else sending them, you're starting over again. <laughs> um, uh, so, remember the Dan Fajella interview? Did you guys listen to it? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Fajella? Yeah, and basically, what? what he's what he's what he did was exactly what we tried, and it didn't work very well in our market. Oh, it's a process, I'm assuming. Uh, but, uh, you know, John made a pretty big uh, splash about the whole thing compared to what he did. He kind of silently um, he, Yeah, well, what Dan did was they built, they built multiple celebrity, multiple tiny celebrity businesses. Yeah, what but they he, did. Dan kind of slowly but surely disappeared. Like, it, initially, it was all emails from Dan. Then 50, like maybe 80% emails from Dan, then 60%, then 40%, then 20%, and then there's like no Dan right. compared to John's nuclear mm -hmm. explosion, which uh, <laughs> changed everything. <laughs> well, if you think about it, it's not like from our perspective, it's it's um, it, it's a nuclear explosion. But from the customer's perspective, it's not really like my books are out there, right, with the brand, like you know, soft books skills will, and, and books are separate, man. That's not because no, it's model. all part of like. In people's mind, when they buy the books, they're like, "Oh, okay, this is John Sonnevis, a simple programmer, right?" It, it's like people are now, still associating. Now you're even There's more. The videos are still on the site every week, right? Like new videos come out on the on the blog, so it's very much still like it, it's not it's not disconnected as 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 you think. Uh, the thing is, like, it's like, and here's the other thing is. That will always probably be a part of Simple Programmer, right? Like my my presence there, but it doesn't have to be with. It doesn't have to be real time, right? It's like there will always be something from John here, right? But people don't know the timeline like we know the timeline, right? They just say, oh, you know, this is the course that John made. This is right. Like you see what I'm saying? Like those are the type of things that um, that that the way that the world sees it. Versus we see it as, oh, John's not really involved well, in simple programmers. We, we, never, we never saw it like that until we looked at your numbers. And then we did the back, backward correlation and started to see it like that, right? Initially, we didn't really until 
those numbers started to say that's what happened. But you know, that's already done. It's water under the bridge, so it's not gonna change. I was gonna but, say. Yeah, but but what I'm saying is why do you guys want to repeat that again? <laughs> why not just, you know, now that you've gone down the path, uh, well, okay, because we we're, we're in like an, an unsatisfactory middle ground here. Yeah, the, the way that I'm seeing it is that um, so simple cr programmer for a long time was pretty much all about John. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, he, he was he was giving people what they wanted. He was teaching them what they wanted to know. You know, so in that sense, it was also all about the audience. But the audience was really, really tied in with John and John's message. And so um, I think what Josh is looking to do, and this makes sense to me, is that he's trying to step up and say, hey, look, you know what? We're, we're, we're doing some of the same things that John did. Um, he, he's going to be a rallying point for John's audience. And then he can start leading things more toward you know, being uh, a more general, not so celebrity, because he doesn't have right. to go all the way to the extreme that John did, you know, but he can be out there and, you know, still give people what they want and then eventually, you know, work it so that it becomes what he wants it to become. Yeah, your yeah. your analogy of Dan is, a, is actually a good counterpoint to what I'm trying to do, I think. Yeah. Because with John, like with John stepping away like what we, what we, in hindsight, what we should have done is we should have been working on this for the last two years, mm -hmm. and we did take a few steps in that direction, but you know, like, um, but having me take over, I should have taken over the emails like a year ago or two, you know, two years ago, and started, and then that way John could have kind of handed handed things off to me. I could have started bringing in more voices, and it would have been like more gradual, and kind of what I I think I might mm -hmm. need to do is do like a basically become Dan <laughs> for a little while mm -hmm. in order to facilitate the, the transition. He, what they were doing was very different too because um, that was like what they were building was this, and I have not been able to get this to work in our market. Um, they were building discrete funnels around Facebook advertising, bringing in cold traffic in the martial arts niche, which is like a red hot niche that is, you know, people just buy stuff like crazy. And so it didn't really matter. The, the relationships didn't matter. What mattered was like the cool moves that the instructor was going to present. Well, and the, with the this type of thing, when, matters. You're, when you're talking about like somebody, somebody who you're going to like trust with your career, <laughs> that's a little different than buying buying well, you know, I'm looking at it, I'm looking at this at uh, this is your opportunity to now that you've already transitioned from so John was the king right right but simple programmer now has the opportunity to become the king maker don't start becoming a king again if you can actually be the king maker now and I guess I guess what, what, that was my plan and what I've seen so far is that Every effort that I've made to not do that has failed, and every effort that I have made, every step I've made in the other direction, has worked. <laughs> right, but but then you're going backwards before you start going forwards again. Compared no, to like, okay, now from this point we're just going to be king makers, and we keep pushing that. Over time, you will figure out how to work that business model. For a yeah. king to be a king, the, the 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 subjects have to accept him. Yeah, that's why you become a king maker, not the king, though. Well, no, you can't difference. do that. You have to build a brand. Like you have to have high touch. You have, in order you to, have to be the prophet. Be, yeah. You have to be. The, you have to be accepted as the prophet before you can be the king maker. Well, no, besides you this, can't just go. You, and, you can't just go. And you, like, you don't know who's the king, but you it's know different. You, you don't know who's the king maker. That's a sass. Yeah. Well, it's a SaaS, but you guys are in the same, more or less the same market space in some ways. You could, you could get into that. You don't know who the kingmaker is behind the scenes. You just don't know. You just know all these different kings who are there, and the kingmaker is the real winner. Yeah, but that's not that's not the model, right? Like you have to have. You could do that with a with a different product, like different service model, where you're going more of a SaaS model. But that's not the the heart of the the business. And besides, like it's it's a mute point because I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, because it doesn't matter. You could actually take my face and keep my branding on Simple Programmer completely and have me do nothing with it, right? So here's the thing: time time dilation, right? It, it's the it's the the time does not have to be um, it doesn't have to be real time, right? So this is kind of what I was saying before. But essentially, 
you could take anyone's personal brand, right? And there's plenty of companies that do this. Uh, you know, we just, we didn't realize it at, at the time, but, but basically like, let's say that you have, okay, when people come into the system, right? They don't have a history, right? And, and really like, if you look at from introduction to the brand, like first exposure to point of sale, right? That process uh, could take like two years, right? P potentially, hopefully it happens faster than that. But what I'm saying is that essentially like someone's exposed to the brand, right? If you have two years worth of content to feed them, that comes from someone's face. It doesn't matter who it is. Like it could be a celebrity. It could be, we could have just, uh, we could have had two years of emails that were written by me or from me queued up, right? You could have two years of videos. You could have like all of this content queued up that you can expose them to courses, all that stuff. And they don't know that it's like for their experience, they're entering the timeline here and they're like, oh, you know, I've been, I've been, you know, learning about John or whatever the, you know, whoever it does, doesn't have to be me uh, for two years, right? And building the trust and, and whatnot. So, so it's not like you have to, like, it, it's not like it's a, you're even building a celebrity business and you're stuck in it, or you're building a non celebrity business and you're free. Right. You can be completely free in a celebrity business if you build up the queue of content right for the because all that really matters in the end as far as making money with the business is introduction to point of sale. Right. And so and having the content and building the trust between those those two points, which you can pre fill that content, you can have that content canned and ready to go. There's no reason why it has to be created in, in real time. Right. But your freedom is only two years long. The big, the biggest, no, the no. biggest, the biggest difference is is saleability. It's it's going to be very like it would be very difficult to sell a celebrity saleability, business. Saleability and scalability, both of them. No, no, you look at well, no, it's fine. It, you look at like okay, take um, working on, take uh, what you call? I'm trying to think of a, of a good one, like um, like Maxwell Malt. Uh, like like psycho cybernetic stuff, right? Like who's in charge of that right now? It's um, Dan Kennedy. It? Well, was Dan Kennedy now? It's Matt. Yeah. Okay. okay, so that's a, that's a, that makes it an even better example, right? Because two owners have taken over it, and they just have a sequence. They just like like they just sell like that that exact same thing in the same system. It's it's his it's his stuff. It's his. What like, are they even thing. selling? They're they're selling courses now. Like, well, there's different things they're selling. Some is the book, some is courses, right? But they just have a sales sequence. Like, it, you don't have to have. Think of it as a funnel, right? Like, it, everything is a funnel. Everything is a funnel in business, right? It's like you have the entry point. You might just have a big, wide, long funnel, but you have the entry point, and then you have content, right? People don't know that it's not real time. It doesn't matter. It only matters that they're getting the nurture that they need in order to build the trust in order to sell the thing. Like it can be totally disconnected. In fact, mo a lot of Tony Robbins stuff is completely disconnected. He has nothing to do with it. He's still the face, he's still delivering the content, but he recorded this shit a long time ago, right? And then he's just, it's just being but dripped out. We know that the there's no value or the value in the Tony Robbins business will be vast, vastly diminished if Tony Robbins were to die or if Oprah were to die. Oprah's business doesn't really exist anymore at the way we know it today. No, right? no, no. It's vastly dis diminished. It's not like, oh, doesn't matter. Oprah is not here, but the business still is the same as it was before. It's And there are so few celebrity businesses that have really endured any kind of test of time. On the other hand, businesses that have not been celebrity induced businesses have literally, there. there's probably like thousand to one. Normal business versus celebrity business. So here's here's what I'm seeing though. You know, you bring up Oprah, and so Oprah went out and she actually built her own network, right? She has her own TV network now, and she's got all these other celebrities who she's built up as part of her network. But she used her own celebrity to do that, and 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 that's kind of what I'm seeing here with Josh right. and John and what they're doing is that John's not interested in coming back in and using his celebrity to to make this come back together and then build it into the kind of network that we're talking about. And it sounds like that's kind of the direction that Josh wants to go where he can bring in multiple voices and help right. build their audiences and make simple programmer more of a, a, a wider so, effect. 
And so right. since John's not interested in coming in and doing it, which would probably be the most effective way to do this, uh, then Josh has to do it. So uh, what I'm saying, yeah. there, there are other ways to get there, I think. But if, if Josh steps up and he's able to uh, command a, at least a, a good portion of what John provided to the audience, then he can essentially take control and then he can start spinning out these other things to make sure that it starts to become less about him and more about right. the overall network effect of Simple Programmer. What yeah, I'm saying I, is there's only one Oprah and one Tony uh, who have any shot of like, well, Oprah is maybe a billion dollar business. Tony is not even a billion dollar business. There's two of them in a world that has maybe two thousand billion dollar businesses. That's the that's the difference of like the celebrity business versus non celebrity business. The size yeah. of the size and the possibilities out there. Like there's so few compared to the bigger. <laughs> <laughs> no one's listening, Manny. No one cares. No, I'm I know everyone's listening. I know everyone's listening. You guys are concerned about yeah. trying to build a celebrity business is all I'm saying. I'm not talking about you anymore. I'm talking to anyone who's listening. Yeah, yeah. No, so no, I'm in the celebrity I, business with very open eyes and ears. Yeah, no, I, no, I, I agree. I completely agree with what you're saying. Um, the thing is, like, okay, so this is what we've run into is every time we've tried to just hand something off, it has failed. What works is doing it ourselves, learning, getting a really good knowledge of what, what is required and what we need, and then finding someone to do that. So for example, I just had this experience with, so, okay, so let's say I, I've, I've been toying with, okay, like maybe I should just go the Udemy route, like just get a bunch of people in, have them produce courses, we sell them for $10. So I, so I've been working with Jason, who is like, you know, I've been, I've been talking to him a lot doing, doing this course really fired up. Every time I talk to him, I get really excited because his knowledge of the interview process and the like, getting developers hired is really deep. And he's coached like almost 40, he's almost coached almost 40 people now to um, all the way through the process and got them jobs at like Dropbox and uh, you know, like significant companies. Um, he put a, he put a, he put a, one of his students through the alpha version of this course we're developing and the guy just got hired. Um, he, he destroyed his interview at the company where Jason works and they hired him. Um, so I'm like really fired up. So I goes, okay, Jason, go like, gave him kind of like a high level overview of what I wanted from the course. Go create this course. Came back to me. Videos were just not there. <laughs> like I was just like, uh, Jason's so dynamic. He's so dynamic in person when I talked to him and then like he, he just wasn't, wasn't coming across in the videos. And he's, like I thought for if anybody could just walk in there and just do this, that it would be him. And so now what we're having to do is I'm having to take a step back. Um, we, we were going to launch it last month. We're going to launch it at the, at the end of this month. And I'm basically, we're doing it together. Like I'm hand-holding. He's doing the stuff. I'm critiquing it. He's going back and we're iterating on it together. And it's like a ton. It's like I wrote my email today about the 90-90 um, the, the rule, which is like, the 90% takes you 10% of the time, or you know, like how the last 10% takes you 90% of the time. Um, and, and that's what it's been like with this course. And so the idea of Udemy is scalable in theory, but in actual practice, it's extremely difficult to, to get all those pieces working together. And it would take me, you know, Udemy's probably been around for 15 years and they've only hit it big in the last two or three, I'm, I'm guessing. I mean, maybe they're younger than that, but very younger um, than that. Udemy is one of the models. There's so many different models. The college investors are a different model. Udemy is a different model. Dan Fajilla's oh, model is a different model. Okay, They're all already, different ways. We're already doing the college investor model. Like the the affiliate mar like the affiliate mar model is like it's about twenty percent of our business. Um, but that's just not like in this market, in our specific market, that's just not it doesn't work the same way. Um, but yeah, so like so so with Jason, like what I'm going to do is we're going to, I'm, we're going to develop this course together. I'm going to launch it. We're going to actually co-host it. So he's going to be doing the content. I'm going to be emceeing all of the, um, all of the, we're going to do live webinars as part of it. And I'm going to emcee those because he needs to be in a live, I realize he needs to be in a live setting. He's kind of like John where um, John's gotten good at the canned stuff, but Naturally, I think John, like for you, just stepping into the live situation is easy. Mm -hmm. John's a natural. Yeah, recording stuff is not as easy. Jason's that way. He doesn't have the five years of 
practice that John has recording stuff. So I'm going to help Jason. So anyway, so it's way harder, <laughs> like it's way harder to, pr to produce one course that's decent quality is going to take me two months of work. So, um, so I need to be able to sell that course. I can't sell that course for $10. I need to be able to sell that course for $200 or more. And the only way that I can do that right now is to have the relationship. But as I, you know, once I, once I have that, then, okay, so I start the Simple Programmer podcast. Well, a year from now, I find a different host or right. we co-host it mm -hmm. for a while. And then, I, then he takes it over. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm like more, um, I'm just going to be, and like the community right now, you know, we have two, almost 250 members in the community. And I'm, I'm, I'm putting in place an ambassador team of volunteers who will go in and help keep discussions going, welcome people, kind of like a welcoming committee type of, type of thing. But right now, I had to, initially I had to be that guy. Right. And that's kind of that's kind of just how I'm envisioning this whole thing working because, um, it's like when I try to hand it off, it doesn't. When I try to just hand it to somebody and say go run with this, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, but if you hand it off and say this is what I've been doing, then it's an yes. Yeah, the, the ambassador is like, I, I kind of figured out how I wanted to welcome people into the community. And then I opened this up and I got like six or seven people that volunteered. And then I wrote up a, a post. They were like, well, what do you want us to do? And so I wrote up a post with like four or five things that I've been doing. And they were like, perfect. This, we know exactly what we need to do. We'll go do this. So, but you kind of have to like build a piece and then you build the piece with yourself and then you replace yourself. And then you build the piece with yourself and you replace yourself. Exactly, and that's, that's what seems doing. to be working so far. And that's exactly what we did with the blog, right? So that yes. was like because yes. it was my personal blog with Simple Programmer. I wrote all the articles. We started replacing like having guest posts and guest writers, and now I don't write any of the articles. Right. right? So yeah, I really don't. Yeah, I really do not want to be. I don't want my face on the front page of Simple Programmer. Um, uh, I look awesome. What? What's that? It looked awesome. <laughs> Especially with this camera, you know, just Josh, take a screen, screenshot Josh, right now. Josh is such a liar. He wants to be all over Simple Pro. <laughs> everywhere. I'm just, I'm just trying to look at what's been working as all. Well. So there will be no John after Josh yeah. has taken over. <laughs> <laughs> Forget who John was. I'm yeah. gonna submit Google. I'm gonna submit requests to Google to replace all instances of John Sonnez with Josh Earl. There so. you go. <laughs> Find all, replace all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> On the whole, like we, there is a functionality probably on the WordPress. There's some plugin, find all, replace all. Yes, yes. Yeah. Across the board for <laughs> everything. Yeah. So uh, I, I do have a couple things that I wanted yeah, to Yeah, Chuck, about sorry. I, I'm just completely monopolized, but go ahead. No, no, it's totally fine. Um, I mean, that's what we're here for is just to kind of rattle the cage a little bit and make sure that, you know, we're all thinking about all of the different things that are involved. So, yeah. Um, I mean, you did mention the, the podcast thing and... I think it was last week I was reading the book, The One Thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized that the one thing for me really is this uh, systems for the podcasts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yep. so, and, and in the book, it was interesting because I was like, oh, okay, well, the one thing, right? So I'll just sit down and I'll make sure I get the, that thing done for the day. I thought that was what the book was about until I read it. And they recommend that you spend four hours a day working on your one thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, I see. I figure out what's going to, you know, what the highest leverage thing is. And then I go do it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I cut back the time that I'm spending on my book. Um, I basically have just guaranteed I'm going to spend, I'm going to get a thousand pages or a thousand words a day. Mm -hmm. And, and that way I'll get it done. Yeah. And then um, I have to keep recording the podcasts. So I'm starting to look again at which ones I can safely bow out of. Because mm -hmm. um, I did that I did that before. And uh, yeah, then I'm going to be spending the rest of my time building out uh, PodWrench. And I realized that I'm just going to start from the beginning of the process and work my way all the way through. So um, currently I'm working on, you know, like you said, Josh, um, setting things up so that people can just come and schedule the the podcast and i already have that um we're moving off of schedule once and onto google calendar google calendar has appointment slots 
and that that's a whole lot it that turned out to be a whole lot easier and um i don't need all of the extra features from schedule once and wait so so google calendar can you use it like so that you can show people a calendar and they can book yep how do you okay just send us a tell us how to do that maybe off air but i i'm using um another service for that calendly and yeah. I would greatly prefer to just have it through Google Calendar. So yeah. So what, what yeah. you do is when you when you create a new um, entry in your calendar, uh -huh. it now gives you the option of making it an appointment slot instead of. You can also mark it as out of office or um, just a regular appointment. And so you just set it as a, a appointment slot. You tell it how many appointment or how long the appointment slot should be in there, and then it just I'll does tell it. You, this is the. You guys should do what I'm doing. It's better. It's better. It's, <laughs> appointment slots are, are junk. I, I'll tell you why. Because every time, okay, when someone sends you an email and they're like, make an appointment, what do you? what's your first response? Like, fuck me, hey. right? <laughs> like, you're like, I don't want to fucking, like, it, and, and then, then you feel like, oh, they're so much more important, right? They think they're so important that you're going to make an appointment with them, right? So I'm using assistant.2. I'm sure you guys have seen me do this in emails if i if you've made an appointment yeah 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 it sends it in line in the email right and they just click the thing that they want right there oh, so they don't okay. have to go to a site they don't have to do anything it's just a chrome plugin for gmail so much better i get so much of a higher response rate of people because all they have to do they don't have to go to schedule one or my site and it, it doesn't feel pretentious at all because it's just like hey it's just coordinating a time Right. It's not like you're coming to my like it's it's in the email. Uh -huh. You're not coming to my, you know, my thing kiss, to do it. Kiss the ring. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I don't know. That's my pitch for it. I, I think assistant two is the best. I'll, I'll, I I'll like probably that. never change it. Um, I may add that in because uh, the other portion that I want to add is the uh, guest and topic recommendation engine. Because I haven't found a system that I really love for that. So um anyway so then you can just send people to a page and they can you know upvote and downvote and share ideas with you but then what you could do is you could just click on you know invite a person or invite this person to the show and then yeah that that would be a good option um but anyway so yeah so i'm working on the invitation portion but then the next piece is um getting all of my hosts and it'll invite the guest in so that they can send me any prep information i need so that would be like mm -hmm. guest in introduction. It would be go look at these links. Here's a video of a talk I gave on this topic. You know, that kind of thing. They can just share all that stuff. And then um, it'll easily make it so that then the system can send it out to all of the hosts nice. and say, hey, here's, you know, here's, here's the information to prep for next week's show. And once I have that working, um, then the other piece that I want to build is once it's recorded, um, in fact, that piece is already in. You can upload the recording file. So, you know, I'm doing it on Zoom, so I just download it from Zoom and upload it to that. Mm -hmm. um, and then there will be an editor portal that just has all, a list of all the shows that have recordings uploaded and ready to go. And then um, the, the last piece of it is is once it gets published. So it'll handle all the publishing and everything, right? I also want to be able to have you essentially add either a plugin to WordPress or set up some kind of credential through the API so that you, when you write the show notes, you can just write it in there, put it into the RSS, just post it to, to WordPress and schedule it to be published at the right time so that it all happens and it's all synchronous and it all it's all in one place. But then as soon as it's published, then it'll email the guest and say, hey, you know, you were on the show, blah, 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 blah. After you record, it'll also send an email to him saying essentially thanks. And, you know, if you want to, you know, send him some swag or something like that, you know, it'll do all that stuff. But yeah, just manage the whole process. And then the other piece that I want to build in is just the showrunner piece. And so that would be like if I'm not the one running the show, it'll say, okay, here are the hosts that said that they were going to show up. Here are all of their introductions, that, you know, that you can just read. Here's the guest introduction. Um, here, you know, here are all of the ads you need to read live, you know, anything like that. And so mm. it's just all there. Like so a packet. Just, yeah. So you just load up the page and then you can just see it. And then um, you or the other host can also be logged in 
and as people mention stuff, you can post the links there for oh, the nice. show notes and stuff. So that's almost like that's almost like um, like the like I think I I, I sat in, in on a radio show one time like when I was in college, and it seemed like they kind of had a system like that where it was like yeah. everything was kind of queued up for the for the host. Yeah, but then but then it's just all automatic, right? Yeah. And so you know if if you're expecting the show to be about an hour long then you can just say, oh, we expect the show to be about an hour long. And then um, I'd really like it to just prompt you, okay, it's time to do the next ad read. And that's right. the other thing that I'm going to be changing on my shows is I've gotten some feedback from a few sponsors that quit and then talk to somebody else that I know, which frustrates me to no end. Just tell <laughs> me. If you're not happy with something, tell me. <laughs> Damn it, tell me. But instead, um, they're, they're telling this friend of mine, oh, well, when we signed up for a sponsorship, we expected him to do, you know, live ads. Well, nobody freaking told me. I told him that I re pre-recorded them and stuck them in there. Yeah. So why is this a surprise? Well, apparently it is. So, and, and I think the, the charge a premium for the live ads too. I've, I've thought about that. Yeah. If they want it, if it's something they're wanting and asking for. Yeah, definitely. It's a thing. Yeah. It's yeah. a way you can, but anyway, that's true. I, I worry a little bit about that getting a little more complicated. It might mm -hmm. almost also almost be simpler just to do all live ads. Uh, but the, all live ads is like I don't know. That's that's that creating a lot of manual work. Well, not, not if they're live, if they're all live on the on, if they just yeah. re read them right. If on I just the read them on the call. Oh, I see. That's true. Yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah. Yeah. That's just part of the flow then. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I guess that makes sense. There's le it's actually less work. There's less editing and splicing. Yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm kind of leaning that way. Um, I think I'm going to send an email around to my current sponsors and past sponsors and just basically say, hey, I got this feedback. Um, it, it seems like this is preferable. And, you know, so starting in October, we're going to start doing live ads. That's You've been impressive. upgraded to live yeah. ads for free. Yeah. <laughs> We've improved your experience. Yeah, I basically. Got, <laughs> I yeah. got an email this week from uh, QuickBooks saying that they, they've improved my experience and upgraded my connection to Chase Bank. And the last time they did this, it caused two, two or three weeks of headache for us with PayPal with Simple Programmer. Oh, geez. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> now, now, Chuck, yeah. With, your, with your thing, uh, I, first of all, I think that's great. I think the, the, the one thing, that's a really good book, by the way. But, but yeah, that's your one thing for sure. It is one thing and this 100%. is 100 um and then uh with with the podcasting side of it i wonder you should look in to see if you can integrate with uh zencaster or ringer if they have an api mm -hmm. because what would be the ultimate mm -hmm. uh, automation for you and you'd be able to control all these things like the show notes you could prompt up automatically but if if Zencaster or Ringer, or there's probably some other competitors now that <laughs> the ones who stole our idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Never, we should have patented that fucker. Podcast really recording. Done that. But, uh, but, um, but if you can get an API or white label essentially, like with mm -hmm. that and integrate that into your workflow, then you can have it so that the recording is in your system so that it's recorded oh, yeah. through the browser and you can prompt for show notes. You can do any of that. I mean, for the reads and all that stuff and no one has to upload anything and they don't have to learn how to use zoom or anything that or record. Like it's just all automatic. That would be a huge value add to that. That's true. Yes. Chuck, the, that the would issue. be killer. That would be yeah. absolutely killer. <laughs> It would be if I could get if I could make it work. I've never been able to get Zencaster to work unless there were just mm. two of us. Mm, interesting. Okay. And so, yeah, I, I completely agree. But yeah, yeah. The other thing is, is I could just build those integrations in, right? So it's like, hey, if you're using Zencaster, I I love the the idea of white labeling one if it works. If, uh, you, could, well, if you could make it so that you could click a button, even if it launched a separate app, like click a button in your app launches over to some other app and then automatically yeah. pulls in the recording that would be yep that would be pretty amazing and i think zoom has because i'm using zoom zoom has yeah. i'm pretty sure a uh um what do you call it it has an api so yeah i'm pretty sure that once once a call ends i could correlate that with a recording right. and just pull the 
So, so there are, so I, I, there are people that are offering like con these concierge podcasting services. Yeah. And yeah. what you're doing is you're automating all that with software. Like, yeah. so they're, char yeah. they're charging really expensive, they're char they're really expensive services. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you know, maybe uh, the one guy I talked to was like, I don't know, he was like uh, probably at least a thousand dollars a month or more. Right. Um, or just to, and he was doing all the scheduling and all that stuff too. Um, so if you can automate all the all the routine work and then have a, 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 a few people who help with booking, yeah, that's this, like a that's, that's like a game changer. It's this like is a game changer. Blue Ocean. This is Blue yeah. Ocean. So the yeah. other book that's pretty similar to Blue Ocean, I think, John, is um, Simplify by Richard Koch. So this this is a this is a proposition simplifier. Like you you when you when you dramatically simplify a process, it can it can increase the demand exponentially. Right. right. Um, so like with it, the one of the examples in the book is like um, uh, the automobile and Henry Ford, like he brought the price down low enough and the demand, ex it, it, like he brought, he cut the, the price down by like I don't, to maybe 20 or 10% of what it was. And the demand increased like, you know, <laughs> like 10,000 fold. Like it was. Right. And then that's the exact example, like from Blue Ocean as well. He brought the price down to the point where it competed with the horse and carriage, not with right. other automobiles. Right. Right. That was the key because yeah. that expanded the product, the market, because now you took non customers, you took the whole, right? The, the automobile industry at that time had high end models and they were competing right. with, uh, with each other for these, you know, and then they had a very small market. But yeah. then when he brought it down to the, Course and carriage price level. Now he made all of those potential customers because those those people. Now he expanded it that way, and it's the same thing. I I think I could see with with yeah. the podcasting podcasting right now, right? Like concierge uh, concierge podcasting, like podcast done for you mm -hmm. service is a thousand bucks a month. Let's say right, something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's it's a high price, right? right? So you have a very small market for that, like of, of successful right. podcast mm -hmm. podcast hosting. Is like ten or twenty bucks a month, right? Yeah. If right. you take the the concierge, like you know, done for you podcast, and you bring it down to compete with the podcast hosting, you will destroy the market because That's why would you pay getting. twenty bucks to get podcast hosting when for forty dollars you can get podcast hosting plus production plus you're going to get paid from sponsorship. Like some, you know, you'll give them a real small percentage, but like you'll have all of these features yeah. all, all for you. That's like, that's killer. If you can do that, you'll completely yeah. disrupt the market. Yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah. Well, and I like the idea of, of some level of concierge, but the thing is, is most of the stuff that we're talking about can be automated. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, well, the so thing that can't be automated would be, Finding guests. Well, even that can be automated. I mean, if they provide you with the names of the people that they want to get a hold of, then yeah. But I mean, like, yeah, like, yes, yes. You know, especially if they have contact information for them. The other thing that is kind of curious is they could also put out, and and I'm, uh, I'm going to say it out loud. It sounds a little bit sleazy, but I don't, I don't think it is. Um, but, uh, I could also, so I have a good friend, Tom Schwab, who runs, um, what, it, what's it called? Interview valet mm -hmm. where he actually helps people get on podcasts as guests. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so I, I could talk to a bunch of those, a podcast that's looking for a guest on a certain topic. And then I could take a cut of that from them yeah. and line up the guest. So like a, po a podcast pimp basically <laughs> podcasting but I'd, I'd be the go-between on the other end of it right for the podcaster yeah. instead of for the guest exactly. and then um I these guys just... are podcast pimps you'd be working with the pimps you'd be the head pimp yeah. there like... we go. <laughs> he would be but, the referring pimp but yeah. the thing is is that if if uh if it screws it up right so if it works out that you know this person's a terrible guest then, you know, if I get a review or two back that say, hey, this wasn't a good guest, then I can go back to Interview Valet or somebody else and say, hey, look, um, I can't book them on any more shows. Yeah. Right. And things like that. It's also valuable, I think, to them to know that because then they can give that feedback to their client and say, hey, look, 
um, you know, we have a relationship with this guy and, you know, the way you're doing the interviews is turning off his, you know, his customers. So, you know, if you want us to book a book you on any others, you've got to change up the way you're doing things. I like it. So, sure. yeah, but, but I love the idea of the concierge because yeah, then it, then it comes down to, I have the name of the person that I want to get on the show, even if it's some big name person. Right. And then, you know, they can essentially, I mean, yeah, then I'd have to have somebody go hunt down their email address and, you know, essentially pester them until they get a no. But yeah, the, the rest of it's all automatable. And honestly, even the outreach is sort of automatable. I mean, people don't like having automated emails sent to them. Hey, will you come on my show? But, you know, you, you can have a person behind it to interact with them and, you know, automate at least the outreach. Yeah. I mean, if you can automate 90% of it, you're, you're good. Yeah. Like, you'll be able to compete for sure. Yeah, so. I... <clears throat> I don't know if I want to build in the hosting piece, but I could probably white label something with like Libsyn or Blueberry. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, you're not going to host it for sure. Sure. You're going to use one of their services or something like that. Yeah, right. but it makes a ton of sense, right? If it's, yeah, if it's 20 bucks a month for hosting and it's 30 bucks a month, you know, because I get a deal because I'm sending a whole bunch of business their way. So it's 30 bucks a month for somebody to sign up for my service and use the white labeled version of Libsyn or Blueberry or whatever. Mm -hmm. I want this check. <laughs> it, it's just like, uh, here's a good example of, of what it, of, I want it this. too, but it's, it's such high leverage. Yeah. <laughs> here's a good example of this exact thing. So, uh, version, right. Uh, uh, what's his name? Russell Brunt, a uh, brand, <laughs> Branson. Branson. Richard yeah, right. Branson. Richard. Richard Branson. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. I was like, I know it's not Russell. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. You guys, Russell Brunson has taken over, man. He would he, he, be so proud <laughs> if he watched that film right now. He'd be like, wow, I've done my job. I've lived a good life. <laughs> so, so, what he did with, with T Mobile, right, is he came in and he basically, like in the US at least, he did this in the European market first, but he said to Sprint, hey, look. I will we'll use your lines, right? We'll, we'll use your, your set, your, your network, and we're going to build this brand on top of it. Right. And what he did is he came in and he built T-Mobile, which was a better offering, right? Because it was like, no, uh, you know, you could do pay as you go, like none of this bullshit that, that they did. And he did it off of there. And eventually, eventually, uh, was it, uh, uh, no, Virgin, Virgin Mobile, right? He eventually did that with T-Mobile, and then T-Mobile eventually had to buy Virgin Mobile. But, uh, but, but essentially, it's the same exact thing. It's like you're using their like they, they don't really have a choice because you're going to provide the service. It's better than their service, so they're right. going to be the backbone of it, right? They're they're either going to get that that value of it, or, or so you're going to go somewhere else and get the value, and that person's going to get the value. So. But yeah, disrupt. Well, I'm the thing is, is like people act like, you know, starting a SaaS or something like that. Like, you know, what we're talking about here, um, it, it, they get all these romantic ideas about it. But honestly, I'm just trying to solve my own freaking problem, right? Exactly. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, you guys are pointing out, well, other people have this freaking problem. You know, uh, Josh is over there salivating. Yeah. I wouldn't have to do any of the work. I would just have to show up and talk. Yeah. Right. So, and, and that's what I'm aiming for. Um, but I also wonder then at some point, and, and this is complete speculation because I really enjoy recording the podcast, but at some point then do I look at dev chat TV and say, you know what? I just want to be completely in the background and let other people run these shows. You are on the track, my friend. Yeah. And I think that's the right track for sure. And then you yeah. just create your own meta podcast that is just like you running the business, whatever you want to talk about, right? It's yeah. just like because you're an interesting character, right? You're the oh, podcast yeah. network guy. Like, so you know what I mean? Like, so this so is you, you just talk whatever you want. And then you well, just have your own podcast to fulfill your podcasting itch. To be perfectly honest, I have two shows that I want to do that are that are essentially that. And oh, okay, if I then. could do if I could do those two shows and yeah. quit all the rest of these. 
and have them run without me, I would be a happy guy. And and, and I think and I it's think... not because I don't like doing these other shows, but they a lot of times they go well beyond what I really am passionate about. And and I think with what you're doing, like you're already in phase one. Mm-hmm. Right, is creating this automation software to solve your own problems. Phase two is taking other people's podcasts. Like we were talking about, like you hosting Simple Programmer podcast, or like right. right? So yeah. you're kind of doing the concierge, but you were working it. You're working it off of. You're making the money not off of the podcasts, like of the hosting of it, and the but off of the, the sponsorship. The, exactly. So you're getting established yeah. ones. But then when you have, when you're in phase two and you get like, let's say you get 10 of these uh, under your belt where you've got 10 mm-hmm. other people's co-hosted podcasts, then you continue building the software to solve all of those problems that you're right. inevitably going to have dealing. Cause you're, you're right now you've got a homogenous set of podcasts, right? Cause they're yes. all yours. When you start taking on other people's and they have other demands and stuff, now it's going to be heterogeneous and and you're going to actually, you know, from that composite, build the software that solves all those problems that, right. you know, that X plus one, right? But, or the N plus one. And then now phase three becomes, now you've built this robust enough thing to handle anyone's thing and now you sell it as a service. Yeah. Yep. But the other thing is, is I've also thought about, um, and I get, like, I get outreach from uh book publisher tech book book publishers and stuff can we get our authors on your show and i thought about just putting together a podcast that's just like you know it's it's basically tech stuff and it would just be hey look every time you want to get an author on the show it's 100 bucks we'll talk to them yeah. for 20 minutes right and um you, you know want to do that? it's just it's just the book show right and so it's an extra four or five hundred bucks a month but oh you know, it's a book about the tech thing It'd we'll be a podcast like, where we just interview tech authors. Um, even if you don't really care for the author or the book? Yeah, it just, you know, people can go see what's coming out. I don't know. Mm. Maybe. Because <laughs> then you uh, lose, lose uh, credibility I'll tell you, and trust with the market if you don't really care for that thing. I will tell you that um, I have made the offer to, when I know the book author, to have the book author on. Yeah, you know, basically, you know, you can pay, you know, however much, and the publishers won't spring for it at all. You kill it, kill that idea. It's no yeah. good. I'll tell you why. Because, because if you're facing any kind of resistance for like a ridiculously good deal, and it doesn't scale, because yeah. at the point where your company is making a million dollars a year, are you going to care about like the hassle for making an yeah. extra thousand That's or two thousand bucks revenue? Won't be worth it. It will never scale up yeah. more than that. But I've also thought about approaching like. Um, pragmatic programmer or something like that and basically saying hey look guys um, why don't you do because they used to have a podcast and so I, I you know I've thought about approaching them oh. to revive their podcast mm-hmm. and find a host and yes. so I would concierge that part of it right yes. we'll, we'll do your podcast for you and you just provide the guests who are your authors exactly and they can come, you know, they can come back multiple times. Well, you know, this week we're talking about this section of my book. And and that way they can go come in, they can talk about what they're an expert on and, you know, essentially plug the book at the same time. Right. And then there won't be sponsorship. They'll be the sponsor. Right. They'll be the sponsor. Yep. You'll be the professional jockey, right? Yeah. For their horse. Yeah. That's, that's what. You know, that, that's that's I, I like that. That's a really good idea. And you could repeat that one. Yeah, multiple I can. Times. <laughs> All that point is paying the regular host to show up. In fact, in fact, Josh, unless you really want to do a podcast, that would be a model that would work great for simple programmer podcast. And, and, and I can tell Manny is agreeing with this because then, you know, then Chuck's finding a host. He's getting the episode, getting everything handled. We're just using the brand name, <laughs> and then uh, and then You're telling me what then, you want the show to be about, right? But in our case, we'd allow the sponsorship because we'd want yeah. sponsorship because we don't care if someone else advertises on our. For pragmatic, they probably don't want sponsors advertising. No but problem. in our case, it would be it would be revenue split over sponsorship. But that's 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 I think that's a better model. Have you guys looked at uh, this? podcast called optimize daily which they do like 
optimize daily business, optimize daily life, optimize daily this, optimize daily. This guy, all he does, he goes around to all these bloggers and says, hey, I will just read out your blog on my podcast, your blog post on my podcast. <laughs> and uh, are you cool with that? And I'll give you the backlink for it. I'll tell people where to go to find the complete blah, blah, blah. blah. Are you cool with that? And he just does that and he collects yeah. sponsorship revenue from this from his podcast and he provides the backlink so everyone's happy. Everyone's like, yeah, go for it, do it. So, you know, word simple programmer, if you would just read out all of your past blog posts in a fun fashion, that's a huge ass blog, a huge ass podcast that you could get someone to do and yeah. that's it. It would just generate so much uh, traffic and podcast listenership for you guys. Well, so, the thing, okay, the thing so, there is so, we could find somebody, you know, some personality that could go read the blog post and talk about yeah. it. Yeah. So, or just okay, read so the damn thing. Here, here's, here's a fundamental difference about the way that I've been thinking about the podcast. And this is actually from, I've been listening to James Stranko, John. Um, he's got a lot of really good stuff on membership st sites. He seems to be the best that I've found um, on membership. And he views podcasts not as a traffic source, but as a conversion tool. Mm -hmm. And that's that's how I that's kind of how I've been looking at it. Like for me, I don't need more traffic right now. <laughs> like we get three hundred thousand, we get three hundred thousand page visit, page views a month, and I'm only able to sell fifty to hundred memberships. Like what I need is to sell more memberships, and doubling the blog oh, traffic yeah. doesn't. Like that's a long-term thing, and I, the, you know, it would it would increase the number of memberships I sell, but it's way harder to double the blog traffic at this point than it is to go from selling to sell a few more memberships a month from the existing audience. So for me, the podcast is more about deepening the relationship mm. with the two twenty thousand subscribers I have in the U.S. to get them onto the membership site. That's why that's why I've been thinking about it. But right. the membership site, uh, I don't know how James Stranko's membership site membership site works, but I have a feeling he is a different kind of membership site, which is why he needs to build that kind of trust with the audience in order to get into that. In your case, your membership site has nothing to do with you, and that changes everything. It's pretty, well, what, what I'm doing, I, I'm actually modeling Copy Chief, which is modeled loosely after James stuff. So Kevin Rogers, who runs Copy Chief, is the guy um so he's taken james's model and done it in copywriting so james charges several thousand dollars a year copy cheap is charging three thousand dollars a year i'm gonna be down a couple levels down from that um but right. yeah like i mean i agree that the i do agree that i'm not going to be able to i'm probably with the current model i'm probably not going to be able to charge three thousand dollars a year but i have found that I mean, the fact that I have, James Shrinko probably has less than 10,000 people on his email list. I have 90,000 and I can only sell a tiny sliver. I mean, out of 90,000, I've so far I've converted 250. <laughs> right. So if you're going to do that, so, then you need to be on there or have your but, ambassadors yeah. run the show. But again, I, I, I'm, I'm, what, I, what I'm saying is a little different. I'm saying these guys, James Shrinko is running a personality business in a way that he's saying, when you come into a mastermind, it's still James Shramko mastermind. Right. When someone joins Simple Programmer Mastermind, it's got nothing to do with Josh, is what I'm saying. So you having to build that it, up it, is a it different It does have to do with me because they have to believe what I'm saying about the community in order to join. That's so different than you having to build trust to sell a higher layer. layer. We're talking $100, $100 product compared to if you were to try to sell a $1,000 or $10,000 product. It's a different game selling a hundred dollar product and the level of trust that is needed for that compared to selling 500 to a thousand or ten thousand dollar product well okay i would say josh doesn't necessarily have to be the host of the show right that but reading the blog posts wouldn't work in this case like we yeah. like the, the credibility in this case for the show would be getting big name like authors and software development figures onto the podcast to talk about you know <coughs> the community like the the kind of soft skills more of that mm -hmm. kind of you know but some tech but but mostly that because that's the the real like uh unique offering of, of simple programmer but as far as as far as the membership as far as like i i do agree though manny with you about the idea that 
uh, you know, like even selling it, the community can sell it and the community eventually will sell it. And it's like testimonials will sell it and people writing about the community and those stories. And it doesn't but necessarily you have to have get to it there. Be. You have to get the flywheel spinning. Yeah, point. but you you may be able to pull in one of these ambassadors and just say, hey, look, I'll pay you to show up for the podcast. Or I mean, there there are other options, but yeah, you know, it's at some level, it's going to have to be somebody involved in the paid community. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. If it's a higher price point product, it makes sense for, to to become more visible of a face. Higher but, price point is entirely dependent on the market, though. That's the thing. and like, also on your personality being able to sell it. Like you know, in the sense, right? If you if they trust you and they want to just associate with you, then they will buy that shit from you. Exactly right. right? I, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I mean, all, all I'm saying is that I have a big audience, a huge audience right yeah. now. I'm hitting resistance with selling a hundred dollar a month or hundred dollar a year membership, and the people that I've connected with deeply are buying it. Mm -hmm. So that's really that's true. so. I'm saying I need to do more of that right now. When I think when there's a thousand people in the membership and I've got tons of testimonials and people have like, you know, with this, this interviewing or the, the, the programming interview course, like I expect we're going to have some really good testimonials and success stories coming out of that. You know, it, it's, it's a, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in the mode where I have to do some things that don't scale. Okay. So here, here's a question. I'm question. I'm wondering if John can, can sell that membership as an affiliate on his YouTube channel and see what happens. <laughs> uh, that's interesting on the, but why not just do it on the email list, right? Like if that's the case, why not just have me write an email to the email list? That would be more effective than doing it on the YouTube channel. Yeah, I mean, John is back. Well, and in fact, I did, community. I have been plugging the membership on the, uh, well, I haven't, I, I did just recently plug the membership on the YouTube channel. Actually, I remember that, that one, Josh, that I did the video response to. Yeah. I just basically did a screen capture there, like in the oh, membership. Cool. And I was like, you know, by the way, if you're a programmer, I know a lot of you are programmers that are watching this, like you, and you haven't joined the membership, uh, you're crazy. Like you, like it's, uh, you know, an obvious thing that you should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> is there is there like a monthly live that you guys would do to bolster this? Monthly live is not scale. Is is not scale. Not, auto, not automation. I know, but whatever you guys are talking about is not automation. No, it is. It is automation because it can be right. Like it's like you know. I mean, all that needs to happen is like email sequences. Mm -hmm. That well, right now Josh is manually writing emails, but I don't think he's. I think. He, I would assume that he's intending to, you know, call the best of those and to make that a nurture process where when people come in, they go in and, you know, the whole trust building process happens through that rather than having to constantly be on the treadmill of, of doing yep. emails. Podcast is, is sort of different, but it, it's also the same thing. Like in, in the fact that Josh doesn't always have to be hosting the podcast. Maybe he does host it from the beginning. Maybe he doesn't host it from the beginning, but, but eventually someone else can like anything that you can outsource is you can automate. How, how about this? You guys can actually host a podcast. That's just tailored to the community, like a podcast that brings the guests from the community to talk about their specific challenges and frustrations and stuff like that. So that builds trust on the community level. It's not about Josh still. Right. It's about the community. And it's like you get a host, literally hire a host somehow and have him interview different members of the community talking about different things. Got nothing to do with Josh, nothing to do with John, but it's still the community be telling itself. That would, yeah. Like, okay, so uh, you guys have, have heard uh, uh, Tropical MBA, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Tropical MBA is sort of that, right? Like, like it's not quite what you said, but it's sort of that because the whole point of the Tropical MBA podcast is about the Tropical MBA community, 
right? Mm -hmm. It's like they constantly remember it or mention it. We're, our members were doing this retreat. We're doing this thing, right? This came from the forums, right? Like that's the whole, the whole thing. Their whole business model is the podcast drives the membership into the tropical to be a tropical MBA person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that changes the game quite a bit because then again, Josh, you become the kingmaker, not the king, right. and you can like literally have multiple people. You show up on the podcast too, but just as a guest to talk about whatever you are working on, and then other people come in to talk about their specific challenges and how you guys resolve them. That works too, and they uh, and I can even pop in on the podcast or two. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like because yeah. then I'm not hosting it. I'm not. It's just like oh, John will be here this week, right? And that would actually probably sell some memberships as well, like knowing that every once in a while. Well, the people who are really bullish about you and for whatever reason are indifferent about Josh, because um, I, I highly doubt that anyone's going to like just hate Josh, you know, but they, no. they won't care about him the same way they care about you. Some of them won't. Right. You know, but it, if they know you're still involved and, and they can see that, because it's different from John, Josh saying, oh, I talked to John or here's a story from John. Um, you know, if you're showing up periodically, you know, you write the periodic blog article and it gets, you know, Hey, we got John to write this week or, um, you know, you show up periodically on the podcast or you show up periodically. If you keep doing YouTube stuff, um, you know, if Josh starts pushing that kind of YouTube content and you show up on that periodically, then people can see that you're still invested in what's going on. Oh, I have, I have, I have. Okay. So there's another one, bigger pockets, mm -hmm. bigger pockets is the other example. Josh Dorkin, okay. who's the founder of Bigger Pockets, he's gone. He doesn't run oh, Bigger Pockets. Yeah. Right? Doesn't run the show anymore. It's Brandon Turner and now this new guy called David Green or someone. I don't know if you guys follow their podcast, mm -hmm. but it's ridiculous, right? That was one of the biggest podcasts in the in the investing industry or in and in, in, on iTunes completely. Right? And every month they just bring in a new or not every week, they bring in a new member of their community, of the Bigger Pockets community. To talk about whatever how was their success what they did what was the story like and or anything along those lines and boom they just you know that podcast is legit man and it, josh like i i didn't even feel a blip when josh darkin was gone and uh, david green who's an employee or who's probably paid as a contractor who's got nothing to do with uh, the company probably uh, he's just there as the host of the podcast now well that that's the other thing too that you you can do and this is something that uh josh can start doing is you know once once you get to the point where you can you know you expand the number the people who are involved in this community so that it's not just these volunteer ambassadors but it's actually paid employees right and so it's it's josh and you know um you know the community manager and the content manager and the interview expert and the you know and that way yeah, you, you get all these people involved in general in Simple Programmer, and then it's the Simple Programmer team, right? And sure, you've got these stars, you know, you've essentially got this boy band, you know, that, that all play a different, you know, they, they sing a different part on Simple Programmer. Yeah. But in the end, you know, it's then if then if Josh takes a back seat, he's like, you know what, I really just want to do the marketing and promotion. I don't want to be out there anymore for whatever reason. Then somebody else can step up. And nobody feels like they've really lost a lot because they know Josh is still around, but they've got, you know, that, that other person. Yep. They've got the other people that they know and trust. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Anyway, I need to get going soon. We haven't cool. done a two-hour entre programmers in a long time. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> this one was John, good. John's been gone. Should we do our thoughts then for the week? Yes, thoughts. Yeah. So I, I, my thought is actually kind of a little bit along the lines of what Chuck was saying. So um, with the new house, I have inherited a about 30 rose bushes. And me being who I am, like if I have rose bushes, they're going to be good rose bushes. <laughs> so I've been learning about how to take care of them. And one of the most important things with rose bushes in, is pruning. Like I thought that pruning was just kind of like shaping it and making it look nice. No, pruning is like essential. If you do not prune, it die, it will die. It will get diseased and die. Um, and you have to like you have to prune 
significantly. Like clipping a little bit here and there is not, you know, is not going to do it. Um, you, you like when you prune, you're taking the plant down by a third or half. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do this, it will suffocate, essentially suffocate itself. You have to cut branches out of the middle so it can breathe and air out and dry out. Um, and if you don't do this, it will suffocate. So like, I think I, I've just been thinking about this as I've been doing it. It's like such a great metaphor because, you know, you do stuff for a while, things grow, That's and then you have mean. to come in and thin things out or you, you just, you know, get to a point where you can't breathe anymore. Um, so, you know, pruning, uh, like what, like you can't just keep adding, adding, adding. It's like, what are you going to, what are you going to prune out? What are you going to eliminate? Yep. I'm going to piggyback on that because I mean, the one thing kind of, I had like four one things before I read the book. <laughs> <laughs> if that makes sense, right? And, and yep. it, well, it was, it was just, you know, okay, Tuesday, I'm going to record all the shows and Wednesday, I'm going to record more of all the shows. And you know, which is still kind of my week, but um, yeah, you know, it's, oh, well, I'm trying to start this and I'm trying to get this other thing rolling and I'm trying to do this other thing and I'm trying to get this other thing do going. And like one or two of those things I've been able to hand off to Michelle um, and just basically, so I'm, I'm trying to make one of those things, her one thing. And then for me, my one thing is this whole process. Right. And so um yeah, just by basically being able to relentlessly focus on on this stuff, it's made a huge difference. And yeah, it doesn't mean I'm dropping everything. You know, I mentioned I'm still writing a thousand words on my book every day. Um, incidentally, I did my I did 1300 words in about 45 minutes right before the show. Um, nice. But um, yeah, you know, it's so so I, I'm not dropping all the other stuff. But yeah, my goal is essentially to spend half of my working hours working on podcast production processes and a lot of that means writing software um and eventually i think i'm going to wind up hiring somebody to do some of this work but i mean just just getting it in getting it done and just being able to focus on that one thing i find that it liberates me so that i feel like i'm actually making progress and the other thing is is the one thing they tell you to ask the question what's the one thing i can do that will make things easier or eliminate the need for them Unnecessary. And, yeah, make them unnecessary. And this is it. For me, this is it. And and so that's why that's getting the focus. And so I, I'm not working on stuff that doesn't matter anymore. I'm just nailing it. So yeah, just relentless focus on the things that really matter. Um, yeah, it makes a huge difference. Uh, let's see. Okay, I got one. I was thinking about this the other day variation is the enemy of progress mm. right grind mm -hmm. you have to grind right so it's like whether it be in diet like people that it, as soon as someone is looking up rest keto recipes or whatever it is low fat you know or you know whatever high protein recipes i know that they've failed on their weight loss mission because they're looking for variation and that's going to take them off track and they're not going to be satisfied with the grind. Because when you're looking for variation and you go after variation, you can't grind. And the secret to progress, now it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you don't ever switch things or you don't ever vary things, but if you want to make progress, you have to cut out variation, right? If I want to become a better runner, I need to go and grind and run and run and run and run my 10 miles, even though it fucking sucks, right? If I want to make progress on YouTube, I have to grind out those damn YouTube videos. If you want to level up in a video game, you got to grind out the fucking, uh, you know, uh, ki killing the enemies and, and getting the collecting the loot or whatever it is, whatever you're doing, you know, podcasting, YouTube, mm -hmm. blogging, any of those things, grind, 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 learning a martial art, learning how to punch, right? Like any, anything that you can do, right? It's like even coding, whatever it is, uh, you know, that deliberate practice is going to be a grind and variation is what kills uh, the progress, right? So the people that switch that are like, oh, I want to vary my workouts. <laughs> They're, they're never the big guys in the gym. Like it's not going to happen because you, you have to do the same thing over and over again, right? The variation people that do, like start businesses and then they're changing direction and they never write a book or they never do their thing or they never build their game or they never build their software or whatever it is. Yeah. It's because they're very, it's variation. They're looking for different things to do. Grind, grind, grind. All the success that I've 
that I've ever had the most success has been when I was grinding shit out. Mm -hmm. yep. I'm with that you doesn't on that. sound like a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't entertain me. I'm you, not yeah. entertain you need some change. <laughs> um, my thought is don't build a personality business. <laughs> <laughs> it's it sounds very uh, fun, and it is fun for people who really want to do it. But some of us um, um, are reluctant personality businesses. Some are like really into personality businesses, and I guess I'm more of the reluctant kind. And the more I think about it, the more I realize I just should not be in the personality business. So don't build a personality business. Well, I don't have a personality, so that's not a problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. All right, guys. All right, see, see you next week. Yep. See ya. Want to start a business, but you just know how to code. Listen to John, Josh, and Derek as we figure it out. We are the Yancho programmers.